Thank you very much for being here tonight. Bonsoir, bienvenue, welcome. We are here from across the country, from coast to coast to coast, as they say. Um, I would just want to introduce myself. My name is Gilles Latour. I'm the current president of the Canadian Craft Federation. And I welcome you to this evening of um, celebration in terms of awards, as well as our keynote speaker for you tonight. I'm going to go back to the script because I'm not quite sure where I left. Um, uh, this year, the CCF has uh, partnered with the Alberta Council and the Alberta College of Art and Design to bring this special event. Thank you to Alexandra Amberly and Stephanie DeWar from uh, Alberta College of Art and Design, as well as Tom McFall and Joanne Hamel from the Alberta Craft Council for their work putting uh, this event together. They deserve it. Uh, thank you also to our many funders and sponsors who provided financial support for this event, uh, including the Calgary Foundation, the Rosa Foundation, the Canada Council for the Arts, Creative Saskatchewan, and uh, Saskatchewan Craft Council, and AssureArt Insurance, along with ACAD and Alberta Craft Council, they have made this event possible. And thank you to everyone in the audience uh, for joining us tonight. It is because of you and work that you do uh, that we host this annual national event. We recognize that it is a rare opportunity uh, for those of you on the front lines uh, of contemporary craft production, promotion, and education to share in the, um, such an experience, uh, one which encourages growth and connection across the geographic and experiential divides. We're here to celebrate craft achievements, uh, to showcase successes and skills, uh, and to discuss current affairs, strategies, and ideas. Our aim is to strengthen and inspire the craft community in Canada and to encourage collective action. Uh, this is the purpose of our conference and truly the purpose of the Canadian Crafts Federation as an organization. The courage you, uh, we encourage you to stay connected with the CCF beyond tonight's event. Uh, to learn about the work we do uh, all year long. And now I'm delighted to introduce tonight's winning lineup. First, uh, we, will be, uh, welcome, we will welcome ACAD President Dr. Danielle Dawes to say a few words on behalf of our generous host. Uh, immediately afterwards, we're honored to have a blessing ceremony take place to acknowledge the territorial uh, traditional territories of the Blackfoot and the people of the Treaty 7 uh, region in southern Alberta. The city of Calgary is also a home to the Métis Na Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Uh, following the blessing, uh, we will welcome our keynote speaker uh, for the evening, Shannon Stratton, who happens to be here. There she is. Uh, after a short break in the schedule, uh, we will then gather for the presentation of the Alberta Craft Awards uh, and the Canadian Craft Federation's Robert Jekyll Award for Leadership in Craft. Uh, we hope you enjoy all these events tonight and tomorrow. For those of you who will join us for the many panel discussions and special events to come. Thank you for your time, your commitment, uh, your committee uh, into the art and to the craft, and your enthusiasm for our speakers tonight. Uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Danielle Dawes. Merci Gilles. Alors, on va faire en français ce soir. Bienvenue. Welcome. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have. Oh, this is tall. A great pleasure to have all of you here um, tonight uh, in our home at the Alberta College of Art and Design. I heard that some of you had a wonderful trip at Medalta uh, yesterday. Um, amazing facility under the leadership of Barry Finkelman. Did a really, really great job there. So, very proud of what they're doing. I'm also honored to be able to partner in this uh, 11th annual conferences, uh, conference organized by the Canadian Craft Confederation or La Confédération des Métiers d'Art, La Fédération des Métiers d'Art. Uh, at ACAD, we are very proud of the fact that unlike many other institutions, we've been able to maintain a very strong emphasis on craft as we deeply believe that craft 
with art and design work closely hand in hand and provide the ideal educational platform for creativity and innovation. So you're all arriving at a very interesting time uh, in, the, uh, in the history of ACADS. I'm sure presidents say that every year of their own institution, but this year it's really true. Um, we just presented to the Alberta government actually a few days ago uh, quite a major plan that we've been working on for the last two years, which is to grow an institution more than double its size. I'm gonna bring it to, we're about 1,000 students to bring it to 2,500 students. So next 12 years, so I know it's a bit aggressive, uh, but that uh, I think it's really quite exciting. In 10 years, we'll be 100 years old, so it's a nice, you know, kind of milestone to, to reach and, and start to really grow. So we're looking at uh, really growing quite a variety of new programs, so we started to work on that. Uh, we just took uh, over a couple of months ago um, an 11 acre ranch, so, you know, made in Alberta, we have our ranch now. Um, we haven't really publicized it because we have to figure out some details about it, uh, but it's, uh, it's quite an exciting uh, place. It's not far from here, it's about 40 minutes. And we're really looking at uh, further developing a residency uh, culture at the institution. And tonight, I don't know if you saw uh, Catherine's presentation or performance a little bit earlier, our first uh, uh, artist in residence. Uh, that's really the beginning of uh, what we hope to, that will be something that will grow. And I see the, um, the ranch as being able to provide some of those facility for us as well. Um, what else could I tell you? We have, uh, uh, you may not know this, but uh, we have 11% of our student population is indigenous, which is the highest proportion of any uh, uh, post-secondary institution uh, in an urban setting in Alberta. So we're quite proud of that. And last month, after a couple of years of working on this, we opened our uh, indigenous Resource Center, it's called the Lodgepole Center, and uh, we're very, very proud and excited about that. And next month, I don't have the date yet, to, we're, you tried to spread things a little bit, uh, we'll be opening our first uh, research center and it will be the Design Center for Social Innovation. So lots of things are happening in the institution, so you're coming really at a time of lots of energy. Um, Gilles thanked uh, some of the folks. Uh, again, a big thank you for the folks who work behind the scene putting this together for all of you, all of us. Uh, from uh, our, our, our team, uh, uh, Stephanie Dewar and uh, uh, Alexandra Amberley, who is the chair of the School of Craft and Emerging Media. Um, I know we, we also need to thank from the Alberta Craft Council, uh, their director, Tom McFall, which I saw somewhere. Oh, he's in the middle, so Tom. Always a pleasure to see you. And, uh, and from the, uh, and from the uh, Confederation, uh, the, their director, Megan Black, who is also somewhere. Yeah. So a conference title, Cultivating Craft Pathway to Practice, is more than sharing information, best practices, new ideas. It's also about sharing the love we have for the act of creating. Uh, and this reminds me of a quote from the wonderful French painter, Claude Monet, who said, everyone discusses my art and pretends to understand as if it were necessary to understand it, when it is simply necessary to love. So I hope you love every bit of the conference and welcome again to Alberta. Thank you. And it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Paul Daniels, uh, one of the elder, who was part of our elders council, who helped uh, uh, work uh, with us uh, on developing this uh, um, Indigenous Resource Center, which is named the Lodgepole Center. And so, um, Paul Daniels, if you'd like to come and uh, uh, bring your blessing, we'll be really proud of this and honored. Hello, everyone. Nice crowd out there. <laughs> Thanks for all the facilities of speech and uh, visiting and meet each other for this large uh, poll. Uh, we, the, uh, oh, I should say Indian people, we, we tribal, uh, the custom for uh, First Nation, the tribes are like Blackfoot, Stony, uh, Shutana, and Cree, and uh, Métis. We worked together quite some time, so this large poll. It's been a number of times that we put it together. Um, quite, quite sometimes hard uh, for
or work on papers and everything. So I guess all knowledge is that. So I just uh, like to thank every each one of you for the leadership and workers and coordinators and all that. And uh, I'll just say, if speaking my language for Grace, and uh, we mind for stand up for a few minutes, and uh, we'll ask the Creator for a, a good blessing for things that they gave us. Thank you. Oh, are they? Tribe <laughs> And now, to on for hanging it in the heaven, not it. Had a now's in the doubt, and in Sunday, you have been picking up what states on Sneed and Chinks it as you wash in the near Kubitin. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elder uh, uh, Paul Daniels, for your presentation and for your thanks. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to now introduce a keynote speaker for you tonight, uh, Shannon Stratton. Uh, Shannon is the William and Mildred Laston Chief Curator of the Museum of Arts and Design in New York City, an alumni of the Alberta College of Art and Design. So I think that, that agrees with an applause there. <laughs> we, we've got one of your own here, which is great. Fantastic. Uh, she's also the founder and executive director of Three Walls, which is an organization that offers grants and resources for artists practicing in the Chicago area, as well as a teacher uh, at the School of the Arts Institute of Chicago, in a gorgeous building, by the way. It's a beautiful institution. Uh, please join me in welcoming Ms. Shannon Stratton. Hi. Um, just give me a moment here to pull up this PowerPoint. Nope. Nope. Yes. Um, okay. Hold on. That's not right. Sorry. There we go. The actual PowerPoint. Good. Okay. So um, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be the speaker this evening. Um, thanks to the Canadian Craft Federation and to the Alberta College of Art and Design, which as you just heard, I am an alumni of. Um, so it's, it's pretty lovely to be um, back at my alma mater. I graduated in 2000 um, from a program that is no longer here, but um, you should bring it back. <laughs> so the inter it, we had an interdisciplinary um, program when I was uh, taking my BFA, and I split my major between the painting department and the fiber department, and Laura Vickerson was my mentor. So I um, have great love for this school and um, both departments, but truly the fiber department was my home. Um, and I went on from there to uh, take my MFA at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in fiber. So I have this long history um, with um, fiber departments, I guess, and craft. Um, so I think that's one reason why I was invited. <laughs> um, probably the other one um, would be because of this new position I have at the Museum of Arts and Design in New York, um, which, if you're not familiar with it, was uh, formerly known as the Museum of Contemporary Crafts. It was founded in 1953 um, by the American Craft Council. Um, and uh, they changed their name when they moved to um, Midtown to Columbus Circle about eight years ago. They kind of did the thing that, unfortunately, a lot of institutions did uh, in the you know kind of late 90s, early 2000s, where they took the word craft out of their name. And I think that's a mistake, but I can't do anything about it now. Um, but it does make some for some confusion with people who perceive us as a design museum. Um, when really, uh, I think that foundation and that roots, the root of the museum and craft is still very much a part of its uh, personality. 
So um, while that's my role, I'm really, uh, I think I'm approaching tonight's talk um, from my position as a besider, which is a term that I'm borrowing from Jenny Sorkin. Uh, if you haven't bought this book yet, it's wonderful. Um, Jenny is a really exciting feminist scholar and craft and particularly uh, focused on uh, the history of ceramics. Um, so I'm borrowing this term or this idea of beside from Jenny um, and this book, uh, Live Form, where she reminds her readers uh, that she's consistently framed the history of American pottery, so there's going to be some Americans and some Canadians in my talk tonight, as working beside collective practices of the 60s and 70s, dematerialized conceptual art, the happening, and body-based feminist art. So it's with a similar at intent that I'm approaching tonight's talk about craft and what an education in craft might provide and how it is part of my own nested set of identities that have up until now, and I think even now, positioned me as beside the dominant narrative for contemporary art practice and now studio art. And I'm gonna use this lovely image of work by Stuart Keynes, uh, who was formerly a, a landscape architect, but I love these kind of tools that are sitting side by side. Um, as a fiber student in the 90s, I was still beside the more dominant practices of painting and sculpture, and then later as a founder and curator of an artist-run space in Chicago, I was beside the dominance of institutions and the art market in shaping of a contemporary art narratives in that city and beyond. And even now as a curator um, in New York, I still operate beside the more visible and lauded powerhouse museums who define the cultural moment due to their scale and history. Um, and finally, as someone with a former art practice, I, I don't make art right now, I operate as a curator, writer, and educator beside the studio, a place I don't currently inhabit. Um, but I'm not raising this idea of the beside as a lesser position, and, and that is not how Jenny refers to it either. Um, the idea of the beside is something that she's borrowing from Eve, Eve, Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick. It's a tough name all the time. <laughs> that is the beside as a generative ambivalence that encompasses a wide range of desiring, identifying, representing, repelling, paralleling, differentiating, and rivaling. The idea that craft disciplines and their attendant artists, materials, histories, theories, and educations have long operated beside other cultural forms and not outside of a dominant discourse is important. That besides speaks of craft's inflection on other forms, its influence, and its own porosity. So I personally drifted away from the studio over the course of my professional life. Maybe someday I'll get back into it. Um, but I always check back to those roots and interrogate them because I still feel um, very much like somebody who comes from a studio background. I, I really still connect with that kind of thinking process. So I often ask myself how an education centered in craft and even more specifically an education in craft that was firmly located in, uh, within feminist histories informed my work as an organizer, curator, writer, and teacher. Um, undoubtedly, there's a really simple answer to that, that I have pursued artwork rooted in craft disciplines as the subject for my curatorial and critical work, um, but there's still something more to that. I approached my work building um, Three Walls, the organization that was mentioned in my introduction, which by the way, I'm not still the executive director of, it's, it carries on without me in Chicago. Um, but I really approached building that organization as a creative practice and as an entity that I crafted with a particular sensitivity to relationships and collaboration, whether that was internally with the artists and staff or externally with the local community and their interests. It was a form that was alive and under constant reformation. At this time I was starting Three Walls, um, I was re reading um, Richard Sennett's The Craftsman. Um, has anybody read this book? Yes, good, great. <laughs> do, you like, do you love this book? Maybe? Maybe? Okay, I love this book. <laughs> um, and this particular quote has always really struck me and, and honestly actually makes it into every single talk I ever give. Somehow this line just expresses everything for me about what it means um, to work in the world with the kind of craft background that I have. So you can see the quote, both the difficulties and the possibilities of making things well apply to making human relationships. In the context of his book, as some of you will know, Senate is making an argument for the lessons of craftsmanship applying to world making in general. The craftsmanship um, 
some of the examples, learning to problem find as much as problem solve, developing heightened material awareness and relationship to your craft, mastering one's tools through 10,000 hours of practice, working in dialogue with other craftsmen, having a sensuous and not mediated relationship to a set of problems and thus one's work, that these are valuable approaches to work that help shape our communities with consciousness. Further to that, Senate posits that there is craftsmanship intrinsic to a lot of other activities and, and work like child rearing, the medical field, urban design, cooking, and so on. Craft and Senate's thesis is not necessarily material, something that the term has been burdened with at the expense, I think, of exploring the scope of craft's possibilities and applications as a distinctive way of working, being, and moving in and within the world. Senate's words resonated as I struggled to reconcile my feelings about leaving behind the studio to build an artist-run center. But they also struck me as I worked on my first major exhibition as an independent curator, um, this show, Gestures of Resistance, The Slow Assertions of Craft, which I put together with my collaborator, artist Judith Lehman. Um, this exhibition uh, opened at the former Portland Museum of Contemporary Craft in 2010. And it was an exploration of artists working in craft socially and performatively. So I was very interested in this uh, kind of the crossroads between social practice and craft that was emerging um, really strongly in the United States um, at that time, but I think has um, emerged is equally, uh, equally in, in Canada. Um, so the practices in the show looked to craft as a specific kind of means for communication, I think due to its association with labor and industry, it was all behind a lot of the work, as well as functionality, community, and exchange. Um, what we were finding in the work of the artists we showed, which I'll just go through here relatively briefly, this is Sarah Black and John Preuss, who um, built out this structure that you see. Um, they were longtime collaborators, and their project, Rebuilding Mayfield, was about the kind of communication that comes between, uh, that happens between two longtime collaborators. They'd erected this uh, drywall partition down the middle of the museum and then um, built out this platform that became kind of the studio for all of the other artist residencies throughout the exhibition. Um, and they built it from scratch from repurposed barnwood and then communicated with each other through the wall about what they were doing, what kind of carpentry moves they were making. Um, and they never went upstairs and looked down at their structure. I mean, this was all about sort of trusting their own process and a kind of choreography that was deeply embedded in their collaboration. And it was interesting because when they took down the walls, you can see in this image, they're pretty identical. Um, there was only a couple things that were different, that were idiosyncratic about um, each other's workmanship. Um, also in the exhibition was Anthea Black, who um, is a, also an ACAT alum of the printmaking department. And I'll talk about her work quite a bit in a moment. Um, Carol Lung, who is based in Los Angeles, um, and she has an ongoing practice of doing these performative labor projects around garment manufacturing. So um, often they happen just like out in public and on the street. So with this project, she was bringing this pedal powered sewing machine out into the streets of Portland and ha she basically hacks various garments. And so when she takes these projects to different cities, she hacks garments that are manufactured or, or whose headquarters are there. So in, in this case, it was a Patagonia garment. Um, Kat Mazza, who, um, is was gathering um, knitwear that was manufactured um, in a variety of countries around the world um, at sort of it very cheap uh, labor costs. So people who were being underpaid for their textile labor, and she was unraveling um, this knitwear and then knitting them back into the textile patterns that originate from those countries where the garments were manufactured. Um, Manglar Lam, who um, does a uh, ongoing performance, ironing performance, um, as a reflection on racialized labor, and as well as in this case, um, she was specifically doing these ironings around um, uh, using fabric that is uh, kind of army drab material, and then ironing them into these various uh, kind of the uh, chevrons that are in um, American army uniforms. And then uh, Aaron Toole, who I'm also going to talk about a little bit more, and Theaster Gates, who is also um, the subject of this talk. So for all of these artists, craft was being located as a specific kind of vehicle for the transmission of sociopolitical content. 
but particularly as a gesture of care or a bid for intimacy in a number of these works. Um, it was being accessed by artists, um, many of whom had trained specifically in craft. So Carol came out of a fiber department, the Astor and Aaron were both ceramics, uh, it had a history in ceramics, um, Kat as well in technology and fiber. So these are all artists that come from craft backgrounds and then are taking up kind of performative social practice based work. Um, and really as a world making tool that I think Senna is speculating on. Um, for me, as a student of fiber, concepts of care have frequently come up in the classroom, as a student and as a teacher in it. Um, given fiber's easy relationship to clothing and blankets and quilts, as students then and now often deploy fiber as a material naturally predisposed to talk about care as subject. Pardon me. In the context, mm, sorry. In the context of gestures, um, care as it pertains to and emerges from craft came about through reference to time the gift, intimate exchanges, and functionality, as well as an investment in process. Aaron Toole took the time and made that time visible through throwing a thousand pounds of porcelain clay during his performative residency into the cups he then gave away to museum visitors who engaged him in conversations about the costs of war. Um, Aaron's a veteran of the United States Army in the first Iraq war, and his care was made palpable through his deep engagement with the themes of his work an unwavering commitment, I mean, he still makes this work, to a conversation about the realities of these conflicts and the influence of the US military abroad. He cares about these issues, and that care is materialized in his labor and made visible. He literally gives form to the contentious subject of US military spending and engagement by taking up space as a veteran, by crafting vessels that carry the subject forward in an unmistakably intimate format. Oh, I didn't mean to jump forward like that. Um, so, as you, you can see back in this first slide, he was situated in the middle of the space. He built this bunker of porcelain clay around him, and then he, he threw as many cups as he could out of that thousand pounds of porcelain. Um, these cups that he makes, he, um, he does you know, embosses, he, he prints, he puts decals on them, he glazes, he does a variety of things to these cups to talk about the costs of war. They always have um, the same sort of sandbag pattern on the bottom. And um, originally when I met Aaron, he was uh, sending those cups to um, uh, people um, in government with a note um, talking about his experience in the Iraq war. And he, he always operates in this somewhat, um, uh, he, he's, he's, he finds a middle ground where he talks about his experience as a veteran and also, um, I don't know why it's doing that to me, <laughs> um, his experience as a veteran and how he um, sort of perceives uh, the cost of military engagement in the U.S., not just on American veterans, but obviously on um, the conflicts that, that are happening abroad that America gets involved in. Um, the cups, he, as he threw them and, and glazed them and fired them, would sit around him in the bunker and he would talk to, he, the, the way of getting a cup would require you to have a conversation with Aaron. So he would talk to you about um, either his experience in Iraq or military spending or whatever the topic was, but there had to be a conversation. You couldn't just pick up a cup and walk away. So he would have a conversation about these issues. Um, and apparently, I mean, I wasn't there for everybody's residencies, but I found it very interesting to talk to Aaron afterwards about, you know, the kinds of encounters he would have also with other vets who came to the museum and didn't, you know, and would come across this project and be really deeply moved by it. Um, so it it's, was rushing to head to Anthea. Um, Anthea, <coughs> who um, takes up care and consciousness in her work both as an artist and an educator in craft and printmaking, and bookmaking. The project we featured in Gestures was her curatorial and studio project, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places, where she hand silkscreen posters designed by other queer artists for public postering in cities around the US and Canada, intentionally seeking out public spaces for their display. Uh, Black's posters meant queer love took up space in public places, public areas that are usually devoid of truly public intervention, querying them through a mode of communication that has become synonymous with advertising for rock shows, movies, and politics, but not love and, nor identity. As a teacher, Black's recently been working with Shamina Chawala and a group of student collaborators on Handbook, supporting queer and trans students in art and design education. An artist book with a letterpress cover conceived with her students as part of her pedagogical practice in queer identity 
printmaking, zine bookmaking, and publication. In the introduction to the book, she says, it is our job to make the most important, challenging, and beautiful ideas sensible, visible, and understandable, and to invent new ways of being and social configurations through the work that we do. And I'm gonna come back to that quote again. The Esther Gates, who closed the Gestures exhibition with a performance of hymns from his project, My Name is Dave, um, at the Milwaukee Art Museum Chipstone Foundation, originally at the Milwaukee Art Museum Chipstone Foundation, Wisconsin, covered the completed exhibition in clay slip. Emerging from an education in ceramics and urban planning, Gates is perhaps one of the strongest examples of a contemporary artist deeply invested in the invention of new ways of being and social configurations, having built his complex practice out of performance, social practice, object making, and urban planning. As a founder of Rebuild Projects, Gates has committed to rebuilding cultural foundations in underinvested neighborhoods, inspiring artist-led community revitalization projects throughout the US. What started as the renovation of a house and candy store in the Greater Grand Crossing neighborhood of Chicago's South Side has grown into a multi-project not-for-profit that recently acquired the Stony Island Bank, which you see the inside of here, now renamed the Stony Island Arts Bank. The bank is a hybrid gallery, media archive, library, and community center that reclaims a once vibrant community savings and loan from decades of deterioration. And it had been like closed and boarded up for 30 some years. Um, and he made this deal with Rahm Emanuel to get this. Um, Rahm Emanuel is not a great guy though, but it was great that, um, <laughs> that the Esther was able to work this out with him. Um, but he was able to get this building from the city. Um, and really I should just, I should point out that Theaster is doing very well as an artist and he reinvests a great deal of his own profit from his art practice back into these community projects that he does, as well as being a very active and persuasive fundraiser. So he's really built a strong kind of patronage around his work that he channels back into this um, kind of community work that he's doing. Um, so it was reopened last fall in 2015 in time for the Architecture Biennial in Chicago. And the bank now preserves and makes accessible collections pertinent to the heritage of Southside residents, uh, including the Johnson Publishing Archive and Collections, who published Ebony and Jet Magazine and um, was, is headquartered in Chicago, and Frankie Knuckles, the godfather of house music's record collection. Gates and Rebuild care for the local, catalyzing economies, creating and funding cultural programming, providing jobs to local youth, and inviting artistic invention. This idea of inventing new ways of being and social configurations is in my mind the possibility for world making that Senate connects with craftsmanship. Ways of being is highlighted by Gates, Tool, and Black's work that invest time, knowledge, and skill in acts of care, consideration, and communication. It also signals a kind of self-reliance. When responding to a lack of dialogue or resources around an issue, how can one take personal responsibility for change? How can one deploy one's skills as an artist in a growing state of economic and political instability, impersonal institutions, atomized social interactions, and capitalist monopolies? Really hot button stuff where I live now. Craft as an occupational therapy um, dates to World War I in Britain, later spreading, uh, spreading to the US and Canada as a means to rehabilitate veterans to the workforce through vocational training. Social reformers in the United States also disseminated handicrafts and manual skills in settlement houses as a means for social and economic improvement for immigrant families and the impoverished. In both cases, teachers were primarily women, as Sorkin points out in live form, reinscribing women in their traditional social roles as healers, caregivers, teachers, and reformers. They are doing textile crafts, as you can see. So craft as an idea comes by these associations with therapy, process, and care honestly associations that get further reinscribed in the absence of new thinking or recasting of old tropes. But how might process care and healing, qualities that are continuing to linger around craft, be productive modes of making today? As a way of recasting these old associations, I began thinking about the connection between craft and the contemporary subject of self-care, which may or may not be something that is uh, incredibly present in Canada right now, but it's incredibly present where I'm living. It's a term that has particular poignancy today around certain political movements, particularly Black Lives Matter. So if you haven't been thinking about self-care as a political movement, essentially it's a 
really a significant topic right now, like I said, around the Black Lives Matter movement, is people talk about taking care of themselves in a hostile um, culture. I think of self-care as a political position which one must take when vulnerable to a system that doesn't recognize and care for you. I see in craft this connection to self-care and the political. Craft is exquisite self-reliance, intensely felt as one of the definitions of exquisite, and perhaps also extremely beautiful, both literally and poetically. As Black had declared when she said, it is our job to make the most important, challenging, and beautiful ideas sensible, visible, and understandable. A project like Black's handbook stands out to me as an act of self-care, for her as an educator, but profoundly for her students who participated in its writing, printing, binding, and distribution. It is intensely felt for its proximity to a personal political position of care, but also intensely felt for the maker's proximity to the process. Handmaking one's politics can be exquisite in its deployment, in its dedication, and in its survival. Self-care as a subject matter is increasingly evident in smart practices um, that I've been noticing, notably Simone Lee's Free People's Medical Clinic, which was organized by Creative Time in 2014, and then further inspired her residency and exhibition waiting room that was just held at the New Museum this past summer. This is some of Simone's um, older work. Lee has long worked in and taught ceramics at RISD um, and works equally in sculpture, sculpture and social practice projects with a focus on exploring black female subjectivity. And what you're, this is from her exhibition at the kitchen and what you're looking at are these great big bunches of, um, of ceramic shells that she hand makes and casts that make up these various bundles. Waiting Room was dedicated to Esmond Elizabeth Green, a black woman who died in the waiting room of Kings County Hospital in 2008 while waiting 24 hours to see a doctor. Consisted, um, the show consisted of public care sessions and private underground partnerships that covered topics of self-care and healing from guided meditation to herbalism, all in a consideration of disobedience, desire, and self-determination. Of course, this is Simone in front of this was part of the installation at the new museum. Um, the show sought to implicate violent institutionalized control and indifference as the conditions under which forms of self-care and social care can become radical and alternative. Self-care and social care are being talked about today as a radical alternative. To engage in these practices is to wrest wellness away from capitalism and locate it in accessible, teachable self-reliance. There's the self-reliance that is a tangible result of craft teachings being able to make your own clay body, weave cloth from scratch, forge metal, and in lessons gained outside of art school, like baking bread or building a shelter or a boat. But looking at the work of Aaron Toole, Anthea Black, Theaster Gates, and Simone Lee, something else I think is evident. The teachings of craft also influence these larger, more performative social practices of care, communication, community, and empathy beyond those more traditional frameworks for perceiving craft. On the heels of Lee's show, which closed in September, is an exhibition study center um, organized by Carolyn Woolard at the Cooper Union called Wa uh, Wound, Mending Time and Attention, that consists somewhat similarly of a series of performances, workshops, and sessions with, pardon me, artists and collaboratives. The study center, Woolard writes, offers free trainings in listening, attention, and collaboration, all of which foreground the relationship between capitalism and time, practice, and temporality. Workshop leaders Sick Time with Canaries describe their bodily communication workshop, Calling in Sick, as grounded in acts of care and empathy. And Sean Leonardo later leads I Can't Breathe, a performance of self-defense class. While Wound is only one artist in its ranks that I know to hail from a craft background, my collaborator Judith Lehman, it builds on language and themes familiar to those working in craft, mending, time, and attention. I end here and on Judith's work as a means to tie up a train of thought about what learning craft might equip us with, how those lessons or tools might be important now, and how this learning is always beside, always adjacent other forms of making, other work, other contexts. Ultimately, how do the lessons of craft inform other partnerships? How do those lessons work in concert with Judith shares my background in fiber and she currently teaches at MassArt in Boston in the fiber department. 
Her current work has grown out of a practice deeply invested in considering modes of communication, time, and tools for learning, adapting, and hacking systems. And this is going to play behind me here. Oh, is it going to? Oh, it was going so smoothly until now. Oh, 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 oh. All right, it's not gonna go back. All right, I've got AV help. <laughs> Come to my rescue, I want this to play behind me. <laughs> Hold that thought. <laughs> it worked when we tested it earlier. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> It's really nice if it's playing behind me. Oh, there we go. Wonderful. Yay, thank you. Um, so, right, her work has grown out of a practice deeply invested in considering modes of communication, time, and tools for learning, adapting, and hacking systems. Um, her project Object Lessons, which is what is playing now, is a part of Wound, both as artifact and in the form of a workshop she does with Kenneth Bailey of the Design Studio for Social Intervention, which is a project based in Boston that um, basically connects artists and designers um, to various local um, kind of socio-political issues in the city. Um, Judith describes this body of work as crafting wordless explanations. As you can see, they're shot as short videos that crop her hands, choreogra choreographing a group of objects on this small stage. Object Lessons collapses dance, sculpture, video, and writing into the movements of small tools. Relatively ambiguous in form, these tools are called bobbins from fiber craft or other wooden implements used in clay or maybe cooking. They're familiar. They resonate as objects meant to tell other objects or materials what to do. Here, though, Lehman deploys them in the production of communication rather than the manipulation of other matter. She produces poetry rather than other things, perhaps pointing the viewer back to a meditation on what exactly we're looking at when we coax form out of other materials with the tools of our trade. When exhibited, object lessons is often deployed by Lehman as something that exists beside. On two occasions, these videos were wordless didactics, working in relationship to the work of other artists in two exhibitions that she was a part of. In her own writing about the work, Lehman asks, is it helpful to have a something in relationship to another something if we wish to temper our noun heavy ways of thinking? As I started with Senate, craft as a term has been both noun and verb, its nounness often overshadowing and dominating the nuance of the act to craft. The two craft shows up beside, as the tools we use, the gestures we employ, the care we bestow, the tone of our communication. It is not the shape we make specifically, but the way we nudge that shape into being. It's the care taken in making ideas sensible, visible, and understandable. It is taking that care and making those ideas come to fruition that are the lessons I took from craft and find myself drawing on in my work and thinking today outside the studio, looking at, exhibiting, writing about, and teaching art, but also outside, also outside of art, in my relationships, my politics, my way of moving through and with the world. Thank you.